Hello, 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 everybody. I do appreciate everybody coming out today. Wow, there's been a lot uh, to get ready for in this uh, little live session. The funny thing was, is I was ready to go last week before I hurt my back, and well, things kind of got out of control in the last week. So, uh, if you don't already know, today I'm going to start work on uh, a stool, specifically a stool for my shop. Um, the, I guess the colloquial name for this style of stool is a perch. It's in the Windsor style, meaning it has a plank seat and turned legs that go up underneath it and those legs go into tapered tenons. Lately, Christopher Schwarz has made this whole thing popular, calling it staked furniture, furniture of necessity. Um, this has been around for centuries and centuries and centuries. It's personally one of my favorite things to build. I built uh, four Windsor chairs at this point. Um, so want to build more and it's funny every time I build one I kind of like fall into that this is the one area I've always been the reason I call this the Renaissance woodworker is it's like there's so many different things I want to try I want to do a little bit of everything Windsor chair making is the one area of woodworking where I could actually see myself just doing that for the rest of my life and it's kind of like I have to like pull myself away from it or I'll fall down that rabbit hole so in getting prepared for this and pulling out some of my Windsor chair making tools and things. It's just that excitement's been bubbling and I'm really kind of excited to build this. So um, I've altered my plans a little bit. If you don't know, I had to postpone last week because I hurt my back pretty badly. I'm doing much better, but things are still, you know, I don't want to push it. Uh, so instead of just jumping straight into a bunch of work, I want to talk a little bit about what I went through for the design process because I remember the first two Windsor chairs I built, I was completely a slave to the plans. And then by the time I got to the third one, I was like, there's like this light bulb went off and I was like, wait a minute, the plans, it's not that they're irrelevant. There are certainly very specific angles, there are sight lines and things to be followed and, and you know, shapes of the, the seat that you wanna go for, but even that can be open to artistic interpretation. What I began to realize is how to go about designing a Windsor chair. Now, certainly when you're talking full blown like comb backs and sack backs and continuous arms and things like that, there is definitely, that design has been refined so much over time that a lot of times it's just not even worth deviating from that because what's the point really? Start looking at the work of Peter Galbert and you're starting to see those bird cage chairs and the cool things he's doing with um, changing the form and making it just even cooler, more modern. That's his domain. I'm not as talented as Peter Galbert. But what I began to, to look at is how you go about designing the chair. And this perch stool is a really good example of that because it's a very ergonomic design. Uh, it's great for your back, great for your posture. But in order for it to do its job, certainly you could make it any variety of heights and it would still be comfortable. The reason for that is because the seat is tilted forward at about 10 degrees and it keeps you upright instead of slouching. But in order to do it right, you need to design it to fit you. So you need to play with the height and play with that tilt angle in order to get it just right. You can certainly play with the seat as well. You know, if, if put it bluntly, you've got a really wide seat, <laughs> you might need a little bit of bigger blank. Um, you could play with the carving and things like that to really get the design right. So there needs to be some thought that goes into uh, the first thing is that angle of the seat. Well, how long do I make the legs? How tall do I want the thing to be? So. You know, there could have been some plans for a perch out there, and I'm borrowing heavily from Peter Galbert here. Back on his Chair Notes blog back in, I wanna say 2009, he actually built this chair and did some little YouTube videos, and he released um, a seat pattern as well as a drawing for the legs and the spacing of, of the, the details on the legs. So I'm gonna be working from those as a base point, but I immediately knew, and I've met Peter in person, Peter's much shorter than, well, not much shorter than me, but he is shorter than me. And I knew that I wanted to change that. So while I will be uh, sharing with you the, the design that I have for my seat plans um, and the, the spacing on the legs, there really isn't a plan to this because you're gonna to need to figure out the lengths of those legs yourself. You may need to play with the splay a little bit to get it just the way you want it. So that being said, we're gonna talk a little about the, the design. We're going to split out a leg and I'm going to turn one leg today and I'm gonna, if there's time, I'm gonna shape 
an octagonal lathe. Because every time I pull out the lathe, immediately people are like, well, I don't have a lathe. How do I do that? And certainly um, the octagonal legs of like Welsh stick chairs or in some of the staked furniture that Christopher Schwarz has made popular, they're all octagonal legs. So I will shape one of those ribbon legs into an octagon. The other thing is I'm working, um, not only, well, all of the stock I'm working with today is kiln dried. Traditionally with Windsor chairs, you're gonna want nice green stock because it makes things so much easier. But since I'm not steam bending anything today, I can get away with kiln dried all right. Um, it just makes the draw knife work just a little bit more difficult to do, but certainly not impossible. Um, ribbon stock is always a good idea. That ribbon meaning you split it from, uh, from a log, ideally. I'm dealing with sawn stock here, but I'm actually going to split sawn stock to at least get me some continuous grain. The reason for that is continuous straight grain stock is going to be a heck of a lot stronger. And that's one of the things that's cool about Windsor's is you can get these really thin, very delicate spindles and thin spots of the legs and it's still super, super strong because of that continuous grain. This particular design doesn't have any of those really, really delicate parts. And I wouldn't really recommend, you know, turning the legs down super, super skinny because I think it would look weird from a design perspective. So we can use just regular off the shelf sawn stock, kiln dried stock to do that. So while I'm going to finish splitting this part out for a leg, most of my stuff is coming from this already S4S dimensioned board here. Um, this is actually was meant to be um, a baluster for decking parts. This is all teak, by the way. And um, uh, we had a huge overrun of it at the mill. We ended up with like four or five of these pieces left. So I grabbed one, cross cut it into my various leg blanks. Then for the seat itself, you're going to need an eight quarter piece. You can glue this up. Um, really the, the seat is going to, the grain is going to run side to side. So the seat is 12 to like 14 inches deep. So you need a piece that's going to be 12 to 14 inches wide, or you're going to need to glue up a plank that's 12 to 14 inches wide. Um, the length of the plank or the width of the seat, since the grain is running uh, side to side, needs to be 15 to 15 and a half inches long. So I've got a piece of walnut here, eight quarter walnut that is actually um, 15 by almost 14. It's a little bit wider than I need. You can see my seat pattern here. I've got plenty of room to play with. So, those are the materials right off the bat, and that's really the, the, the only guide point that I can give you to start with is the materials you're looking for. The links, all those legs are gonna run anywhere from 22 to maybe 28 inches long, dependent upon your height. So before I jump into the design, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you're new to one of my live sessions, I'm it. I'm the only one here. There's no one monitoring the chat room right now. So uh, I do want to uh, talk to you guys. If you do have specific questions, if you could do me a huge favor, put them in all caps. It just makes it pops out of the chat room, makes it a little bit easier for me to see there's a question here and feel free to ask questions. That's one of the reasons I'm here. Um, so that being said, let's move on to some design work. Let's get that out of the way. First of all, what I want to do um, is talk to you about how I set up the legs. I have a shop stool here. I bought this thing probably 10 years ago. Um, I want to say I bought it from Rockler. It's one of these cool things that's got an integral screw and adjusts the height and all that stuff. But I've outgrown it, let's be honest. Um, this flat plank seat is just really not comfortable. It's gotten a little bit old and rickety at this point, but it is a great, um, great place to start because it is a stool, I can sit on it and I can say, you know what, it's a little bit low. And in this case, I can raise and lower it, or you can just take blocks, scrap wood or whatever, and shove it underneath the legs, mess around with it a little bit and, and kind of figure out what's a good height. And this is also really beneficial for creating the, um, the forward angle. Let me just angle this down a little bit so you guys can see what I'm doing here. So you can see I've taken one of those teak blanks and I've stuck it behind the two legs. Now, if, if I didn't say this before, the perch is a three-legged stool, which is another thing that makes it super easy because three legs will always stand firm on a surface. If I put this uh, approximately one and three-quarter inch blank underneath it and I sit on this, immediately this feels so much better than that flat seat because it's angled forward. But it, it could probably go a little bit more. So let me grab 
couple of bevel gauges. And this is the first thing that I'm going to um, borrow directly from the works of Peter Galbert and uh, Curtis Buchanan, uh, Dave Sawyer. If you guys don't know these people and um, you're all interested in Windsor chairs, you need to get to know them because they are, they are the masters, the current masters of this form. Um, all of them agree that the perch should sit, should angle forward 10 degrees to give you that most um, ergonomic uh, uh, um, function, <laughs> feature. Uh, this is a, a bevel angle guide that, um, this one's actually Veritas. There's another one out there called Bevel Boss, which is pretty good. Uh, what I like about the Veritas deal is it's got this fence that you can lock. So I've set this at 10 degrees and because there's that fence, it makes it really kind of super easy to come in and set a bevel gauge off of it. So I'm just going to eyeball this at this point. And I am definitely not at 10 degrees. I am shallow of 10 degrees. Again, I don't have a perfect vertical here. I'm just eyeballing the vertical, but I can also see that that is actually 10 degrees. So I probably could go up. Let's just take this piece. All right, that's pretty good. Let me grab and just verify that I'm plumb in the front. So I'm going to use this T-square. Set the T-square, set the, the bevel against the T-square. So I am vertical. Slide it down. Okay, I am steeper than 10 degrees at this point. So I got to keep playing with this and using little shims to bring it up to right there. Um, long story short, this is the process that I went through and I figured out that the back needs to be um, just under two inches taller than the front in order to give me that perfect 10 degrees. And believe me, when you get to that 10 degrees, it's amazing. Like right now, this feels a lot better than flat. Right now, flat, my, my back is arching. It kind of feels like it's compressing my spine. I go up, let me find the, <laughs> make sure I put it on there. When I go up just under two inches, that feels a lot better, but there's still a little bit of that compression. When you get it to 10 degrees, it shifts all your weight forward and it immediately straightens your back out and it's, it feels fantastic. Then take away the flat seat and add a little bit of sculpting. It, it's just an incredibly comfortable seat to sit in. But 10 degrees is that magic number. You need to figure out what that differential is from the front leg to the back leg. And I'm not worrying about splay or rake angle or anything at this point. What I'm trying to figure out is the height from the floor to the top of the seat. In order to get 10 degrees, I need to be one, well, we're just gonna round up and say two inches higher. And that's another key point for this whole thing is I'm aiming to make everything just a little bit longer because it's real easy to trim the legs at the end. I'm gonna be trimming the legs anyway to get the angle right and get them to sit flat on a surface. So if you're, if I say really it's one and seven eighths, but if I round up to two, that's okay because I can trim a little bit off the back and I can dial in that 10 degree angle relatively easy. So that was the first thing. I knew that the back legs needed to be two inches longer than the front leg in order to give me that 10 degrees. Next thing I did was figure out kind of what's a good height for me, what feels most comfortable. So I started taking blocks and setting them under both the front and the back, raising the entire thing up, adjusting that angle and everything and getting it just right. And there was no question, this was okay, but it felt too low for me. Um, and if I wanna sit at it, work at my bench, it just felt a little bit low. So I ended up raising the whole thing up um, just under an inch. Then I grabbed my stool and I set it up right here. And set, again, what, in order to maintain that 10 degree angle, it's all about the distance from the legs to the top of the seat, right? So you can just say vertically, 
it needs to be two inches difference if I'm in this plane. But now I'm working on this, this angle here. And obviously this distance is shorter than this angle distance, right? Pythagorean theorem, <laughs> a squared, b squared, the, pi, the Pythagoras is Pythagorean. This piece here is going to be longer than the vertical dimension. So then what I needed to do is grab my tape measure. Where the heck is my tape measure? Oh, it's right in front of me. And I started measuring along this axis, along this splayed angle. And again, it's a little difficult to measure from the top of the seat, but I, was, I need to add on the dimension of the seat, or you can sing it out here on the bench top set that angle and measure what you're doing there. Um, and I, I ended up playing with my legs and getting, knowing the height that I wanted, knowing the, everything that I wanted and measuring out the legs themselves along this splayed angle. What I came up with is back legs, move this stuff so I don't trip over it. came up with back legs that are 28 inches long and then the front leg is 26 inches long. It's the two inch differential there to create that 10 degrees. It's really a very, you could get a lot more technical in this um, in, in talking about what angles do I want to sit in. You could play around with, with um, the rake and splay to figure out that exact angle and measure everything along. If you don't have a stool, just sit on something, you know, sit on a box and put blocks underneath it and move the thing around. In fact, a, a, just a straight box, probably a lot easier because it doesn't have all the various um, things to work around. It's a lot simpler to measure through. There is going to be some differential with the rake and splay. So if you were just working on a box, I can tell you that your angles on the front I'm just going to tell you this now. Don't worry so much about these numbers, but the resultant angle on the front is 22 degrees and it's 10 degrees on the back. So with those numbers and sight lines and everything on the pattern, you can kind of start to figure out the angles that they're going to run out. But I really don't want you to obsess too much about that right now. Again, if you're, if you're unsure and you think, well, I think it's 26 inches long, but I don't know if the angle is going to change things, round up an inch, make it an inch longer. And what you'll do, the pattern of the leg itself, it's got some kind of cool features and things on it. I'm doing the, the double bobbin um, style here. So imagine a piece of bamboo and there's those nodules along the way. It swells to the nodule and then it kind of tapers and then it swells back to the nodule. That's the design I'm going with. But the last nodule is set up um, like six or seven inches from the bottom. And there's just a gentle taper all the way to the bottom. So you actually have quite a bit of room to play with down here with that gentle taper that you could saw off a full inch without it looking terribly wrong. So there's a lot of room to play with here. And this is where that, that light bulb went off in my head that, you know, I'm thinking I've got to have a plan. I've got to have the exact dimensions. Really, there's a lot of experimentation that goes on. So you have to be prepared to put this together and go, something doesn't feel right. Let me hack off a half an inch um, and change that. The angles themselves um, are on this, this pattern that I'll be showing you guys. And that's kind of important to, to hammer some of that out. If you're starting entirely from scratch, you can actually do a lot of experimentation just by setting a board on your bench and kind of playing around with the look and feel of things. Um, Christopher Schwartz has a good exercise where he uses coat hangers and just epoxies them into the seat and kind of plays around and looks how it sits and things like that. Peter's got this cool little jig that, um, actually is like a vice and he can take leg stock and actually clamp it in and still kind of move it around. So imagine clamping it like a ball joint type thing to allow you to move and position things around and just see how things look. So a lot of it just comes down to just kind of looking at this and going, oh, that looks, I kind of like that, that splay and let's rake it out a little bit and see how things go. Um, that's a level of experimentation that comes from, you know, building a bunch of these which is why we do have a seat pattern with sight lines and resultant angles to work off of. But for now, the most important thing is determining the, the length of the blanks that you're gonna need for these legs. Because that's the next thing I wanna do is actually start making legs. Um, I saw some questions in here, let me... Sure, um, would, it, would it 
help to hang a plumb bob off the ceiling? Um, uh, absolutely. Um, anything you've got to determine vertical. I just use the T-square because it's in my grasp. And again, it's not like it has to be super, 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 super accurate. But anything you can to determine your, your vertical line is perfectly fine. Um, Dane is asking if I'm using the design. Um, I, I said this a little bit earlier. Dane, I am borrowing from Peter, Peter Galbert's design. Um, and when we get into the seat, I'll be talking more about that, that pattern and things as we shape it. Um, for now, what I want to do is create a template for my legs. And I want to lay out my leg shapes. You can do this on a piece of paper if you want. I happen to have some eighth inch plywood floating around here that I like to use for, for patterns. So I will go ahead and just rip a, a three inch strip out of that. By the way, hi David. <laughs> Glad to see you join the hand tool school. And yeah, get in there and introduce yourself, man. We've got a great community in there. <laughs> Eighth inch plywood. If only everything ripped that fast. Wouldn't that be wonderful? So the cool thing about turned legs like this is, you know, you can have really complex patterns and such. I've really come to like the double bobbin pattern, just that little bit of a Asian look with the bamboo. I just think it looks kind of cool. And it's a heck of a lot easier to execute than the baluster style with lots of beads and coves and everything. I, I honestly don't know that it would look as good on this relatively simple bench design. Let's move this saw out of the way. I've come to determine that the only way that a guy like Roy Underhill can do his show in like 25 minutes is because he never puts any tools away. I'm a little bit uh, anal retentive in that respect. <laughs> I like to keep my tools out of the way. So what I am going to work on is laying out the pattern and on Peter's chair notes blog, you're going to find uh, basically a hand sketch drawing of the legs. And I'm just going to show you on my phone real quick. Uh, no one's going to be able to see that. That's not good. All right. Well, I'm going to draw it out then <laughs> because that's just easier to show all that. Um, I'm not what I'm looking for is just, it's not like I'm doing a pattern, like a routing pattern or something like that. I'm looking for a pattern that I can use just to lay out primary points on the, um, while I'm working on the lathe. And that just makes things so much easier because the actual shapes, the coves and things that I create are not necessary to draw out. So Peter has, I'm going to do the front leg on one side and the back leg on the other side. Peter calls for a front leg in his design that is, let's see, 12 and a half, uh, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Yeah, so his front leg calls to be 22 inches long. My front leg is going to be a full four inches longer. I want it quite a bit taller. And again, I'm rounding up a little bit here if I need to. Um, this bottom swell is five and a half inches. So I need to come up with a four inch difference here. I need a pencil first. So we're going to call this front. And we're going to start off this bottom here. And I'm going to mark out 26 inches. Now, the one thing I don't want to change is the tenon at the top. The tenon is going to be two inches long. It does not matter where, you know, how long your total leg is. It's two, it's, it's two inches long. So I've come down two inches. 
he calls for a seven eighths of an inch transition from the last knuckle to the beginning of the taper. I'm going to leave that the same. So the next transition is two and a half inches long, then five and a half, then seven, then five and a half. Uh, so I've got one, two, three, four more transitions here and I need to make up four inches. So I can add an inch to each one of these and I'll end up with my longer leg. But I think what I'm going to do is split it out a little bit more. I'm going to add two inches to the bottom. That gives me plenty of room to take up any slack. So what Peter calls for is at five and a half inches. I'm going to make it seven and a half inches to that first transition. The next one he calls for seven inches long. I'm going to add an inch to that and make it eight inches long. So seven and a half plus eight is 15 and a half. That's my next transition. Peter's next transition is five and a half inches long. I will add an inch to that, make it six and a half. So 15 and a half plus six and a half is what? 22, 21, yeah, 22. So that takes up my four inches. So his next transition and my next transition should be the same. He calls for two and a half inches. And I've got one, two and a half. Perfect. So what that means is, where's my square? I'm going to just square some of these lines across. the end of the leg, it's the transition and the tenon. Um, and we're going to call this, at this first nodule, it is 1 and 11 sixteenths wide. And this is 7 and a half inches. This next one is eight inches. This next transition is one and three eighths inches wide. This distance is six and a half inches. This is one and three sixteenths. Again, I'm pulling these numbers directly from the drawing that Peter put out. Uh oh, I did something wrong here. Hold your horses. Seven and a half, eight. Two, three, four. So then I've got two and a half, two inches. Ah, I see what I did. Okay. It is helpful if you start with a plywood pattern that uh, doesn't already have some ancillary marks on it because then you get them confused. And this mark should not exist. I just squared that across for no reason. So there we go. So now we've got our two inch tenon. The tenon starts at seven eighths of an inch. And actually it scrolls down to one and a half inches wide. So there, I've got my front leg now laid out. This is the pattern that I just take to the lathe and I can use a marking tool to lay out all these different um, transition points. And then I can very easily use calipers to set these depths. I'll do that once we get over the leg. The back legs, those are going to be 28 inches long. So we're going to go down two inches from that for my tapered tenon. We're going to add seven eighths for a transition there. Those things stay the same on all the patterns. So this will be So 
sorry. I can't add. I used to be able to read a ruler. Then I started hand tool woodworking and never used a ruler. So there we go. That's the proper transition. And this will be a half inch on this end. So let me go to his front leg. Pull up that image. Um, I will uh, link to link to these um, images. Um, I mean, I suppose I could just paste the images on the uh, on my blog post, but I think I'd rather send the traffic to Peter because they are his images and credit where credits due, right? So now, um, in this case, Peter's rear legs are. 13, 19, 22, 22 and a half, 24 and a half. I want mine to be 28. So I've got three and a half inches to make up there. So again, I'm going to start down here, add two inches. So what you're going to find is a lot of this is going to be very much the same as the front leg, just some little subtle differences here and there. So seven and a half. The next transition, he calls for seven and a half. I'm going to make it eight and a half. So seven and a half plus eight and a half is 15, 16. That takes up three inches. Now I need to add a half. So his next transition is six inches long. I will make it six and a half inches long. 16 plus six, 22 and a half. Then he's got three inches to that next transition. We've got all that. So let me just lay in these marks real quick. And I'm going to draw a line like right down the center of this piece to differentiate my madness. Those are my two legs. So from the bottom of the leg to the first transition is going to be seven and a half inches long. The width of that leg there is one and 11 sixteenths. The next transition is eight and a half inches long, which I suppose I don't even have to write these out because that's what the pattern's for, right? Um, that is one and three eighths. I should mention the bottom of the leg is 13 sixteenths in both patterns. We're talking diameter at this point. Six and a half is the next transition. One and three sixteenths. Then we've got one inch here. seven eighths and it tapers down to the end. So each one of these legs is, you know, it's, it's tapering, it's swelling and it's kind of tapering down. And you've got this gentle cove between each one of these parts. But the key is that cove really that's up to you, how you want to make that cove look. So just by penciling that in, I can start to see a little bit of what my leg is going to look like with that double bobbin design. It's really not super necessary to have it um, drawn out on this pattern because all I care about are these dimensions, these radii and things like that. So I have what I need on this pattern now to turn my legs. But first, uh, let's see, Derek says, you comment on design considerations for leg configuration. Two legs in front, one in rear versus one in front and two in rear. Oh, okay. Um, I do not like one leg in the, f in the rear. Um, I suppose it would be okay in this particular design because the seat is angled forward, so your weight is driving forward a little bit. But in most, most of us, 
Most of us don't have perfect posture, right? So we're gonna slouch a little bit, which drives a little bit of the force of the seat back. So I would much rather have two legs supporting the back to prevent from tipping over backwards um, as compared to just the single leg in the front because you don't have just a single leg in the front, right? You've got the single leg and then your two legs. You actually have a tripod in the front for support. Unless you make it too tall and your feet don't touch the ground, in which case you've designed it poorly, you need to make it shorter. Putting two legs in the front leaves like the back a little unstable to me. Um, Derek says that Chris Schwartz used, I don't remember seeing a design where there was two legs in the front and one in the back. That just seems unstable to me. It just seems like as you're sitting down, if I put this, I mean, granted, if you splay it enough, it'll be stable no matter what you do, but no matter what happens, when I'm sitting down, initially I'm driving force down and back as I sit. And if there's just that one leg there, there's this potential for the whole thing to rock around. Again, you could see that it's relatively stable because it's a three leg pattern. I just, I don't think when you tilt it forward like that, I don't know that ergonomically that really makes sense. I'd rather have that one leg and you can, your legs, your physical legs can ride around that central stool leg a lot better. Um, I think I've seen some contemporary designs where it's the opposite, but for the most part, I don't, um, I don't, uh, I don't like that idea. Why are all my pencils stubby with the full erasers? Because uh, I never, I very rarely use erasers and they all end up becoming like petrified. So I use these things. And the pencils are stubby because I'm a pinch penny, I guess. <laughs> I've got long ones over here. I just, when this one gets so short that it doesn't fit in this pocket anymore, I grab a long one. All right. Is that all of the questions? Did I miss anything? <laughs> Hypotenuse. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> the Pythagorean. <laughs> that was most definitely a brain fart. You know, that other part of the triangle, the Pythagoras. <laughs> yeah, the hypotenuse. That's the one. The C squared part. Um, so let's go ahead and take this stock and let's rev it. It would be really nice. I should bring my chopping block into here, but I don't, don't want to do that. You know what? I will use my rickety stool. We'll see how that works. I just don't want to put it right on the floor right now because then it, it gets really difficult to see. Let's do that first. Uh, okay. Now you can very easily make legs like this just using firewood. If you've got firewood pieces that are long enough, um, it's going to be relatively green. I mean, there's some firewood out there now that is actually uh, dried because they want it to catch fire easier. But there's nothing wrong with using just plain old everyday kiln dried material. I've got this little bump in the grain running on just one side that might actually give me problems. I've got enough stock here that not only do we need three legs, but we're going to need two stretchers, one connecting the back two and one that is like a T junction from the back stretcher to the front. So if for some reason this splits too narrow in one spot, I think I will be okay using it for stretchers. So what I'm looking for, you remember our max dimension on this is one and 11 16. So essentially one and a half inches is our max dimension. I've got two down here and almost three up top. Um, this side, you can see the rough grain has already been riven out. This is running with the grain. This side is the sawn side and I can actually see where there's some grain out. So what I want to do is actually split that away. Um, generally, I wouldn't split a piece that's this size. Um, this is close enough that I would use my draw knife and go at it, but you know, what the heck? Let's see, this is the problem with putting it up high is I don't have any leverage on it. So I'm going to put a little bit of leverage in there and it splits away that thick part. And you can see 
<laughs> that big swelling part, that was the only part that I had to split away. I probably should have chosen better stock for this, but it's relatively easy to split when it's already really small like this. But instead of that huge bulge to move away and where that grain, remember I said there was that little bump in the grain? This runs pretty close to the edge and then it went kind of wonky up here. I split along the grain and now I've got a much more uniform blank that'll be a little bit easier to shave. It was very anticlimactic, I apologize. <laughs> All that talk about splitting and it was like three seconds worth of work. But again, most of us are gonna be running into situations where we're working with stock that is, um, you know, sawn, that's from the lumber yard or something. And the whole riving exercise is kind of academic at that point because we're gonna be using stuff that is a totally different material. So I'm gonna come over here to my shaving pony. Hmm. Okay, Derek says it was on his Instagram feed, Christopher Schwartz's Instagram feed. That's cool. Um, I mean, there's so many ways to skin a cat, right? But I, I don't know. I like the look of, and I like the stability of the two legs in the back. And what is it that Chris always says? Disobey me, right? So I'm disobeying him. What I wanna do here is get this prepped for the lathe. So I just wanna take off my corners. You gotta love a nice kiln dried board. Makes things a little bit harder. spot down here. This is that little wonky part. There we go. Actually, if I were steam bending this, it would work out pretty well. So I'm getting down to one growth ring here. That leg, that's pretty good. Corners are knocked off and I can chuck that up on the lathe. <laughs> Helps to have a nice, freshly sharpened draw knife. Because <clears throat> I'm working in teak, I'm just gonna wipe this down a little bit. Get some of those resins off. <laughs> Derek says, 
you arrived the leg stock from Teak, would have loved to see how you did that from a board. Well, that's what I just did. What do you mean you would have loved to see how I did it from a board? That was from a board. That was from an eight quarter board. I had already riven one edge for the purposes of time. Or if you want, you can go back to the campaign stool build that I did on my blog. Because that's where this stock comes from. It's left over from that campaign stool. But it was just a regular square old edge board and I used the, the fro, split it out. And you know, in what I'm talking about in this case, it's technically I've only got two ribbon edges. Because if you look at this piece, you can see this is the sawn face here. And this is the sawn face there. So it's not perfectly ribbon, but it's pretty dang close. And as I sight down here and I look at the grain, I can see the grain is running perfectly parallel to those edges. But that was a board. I started with a board rather than like a wedge shaped log. Make sure I'm not missing any questions. Dane just set up front. Um, first of all, Peter whom? Peter Galbert, the man, the myth, the legend. Um, I reference Peter all the time because first of all, his designs are fantastic. Second of all, he's a truly great teacher. You run into a lot of these guys that are incredible craftsmen, but maybe not so good teaching. He's really good at it. He's constantly thinking of new ideas to convey a complex idea. Um, if you don't read his chair notes blog, if you don't own the Chairmaker's Notebook and you're at all interested in this, even if you're not interested in Windsor's, that book is fantastic. Probably the best woodworking book I've ever read. Just awesome stuff. Um, uh, Dane, in reference to why not two legs in the front, again, I think we talked about that with Derek, but you could make a four-legged stool. Um, I see no, re no problem with that. Certainly three legs will stand stable on any surface because of that tripod effect. But with a Windsor, that's one of the beautiful things about the Windsor style, the plank seat with the tapered legs. They are self-leveling <clears throat> because the legs all splay out. And when you sit on it, it the, just the weight down causes everything to kind of smoosh out a little bit and it sits perfectly level. Now certainly stretchers and things on the bottom do restrain some of that motion, but um, all the Windsor chairs I've ever built are four-legged Windsors and they sit flat on all kinds of manner of funky surfaces just because of the way that design works. So there's no reason why you couldn't put two legs in the front and two legs in the back. I, again, just really don't like the idea of two legs in the front on this particular design. Um, so let's go knock some edges off this stock so I can get it ready for the lathe. Come on, what are you stuck on? Man, it does not want to come out. Let's take a little off behind it. Skew that blade. There we go. Ah, look at that. There's something nasty in there. I guess I could have seen that. There's a little bit of a grain fluctuation there, so there's some sort of nasty something that is interfering with the grain. And it leads right up to it. And this is the fun part of sawn stock. So that may be give me a little bit of problems on the lathe in a minute, but we'll live.
keep it in that little groove I've got on my jaws. There we go. You gotta love the... Work with green stock just once and you'll be like, man, I wanna go back to that. close at this point. We've seen this before, so let's uh, let's move to the lathe, shall we? Uh, Derek, walnut splits just fine. Uh, walnut is a semi-ring porous wood, so it's going to split beautifully. <coughs> um, do I have a small eight quarter? Derek says, could you do that by looking for run out? I don't know what you mean, Derek. Can you clarify that? <clears throat> are surprised how stable it is. I don't know what uh, Derek is saying. Derek, are you uh, um, smoking something right now? Oh, okay. All right, well, Derek, if you wanna make a stool with two legs in the front, buddy, do it. I don't wanna do it. So you do it, knock yourself out. Um, you want to see if I have walnut stock? Um, not really, not eight quarter here in the, I mean, I've got a piece of beautiful crotch figure, but I'm not going to split that. So no, um, I don't, don't have that, you know, here in the shop right now to, to do that. But um, I guess I'm a little confused as to what you think would be different from what I just showed. It's splitting from a board. It's the same thing as any time you've seen me split out pegs from a board. It's the exact same process. Um, everything splits out and you end up with nice uh, straight grain stock. Um, I'm gonna come down to the lathe. I'll make this a uh, front leg. The one thing you have to recognize is that there is there are so many variables in something like this that you know if you want to play with the design and do you know different um, uh, uh, what am I trying to say different leg configurations that's what's fun about this whole thing right that's the the beauty of it is being able to to determine what your stool, what your chair looks like. Uh, I'm making this too difficult. I was trying to find my center finder, but I apparently have lost it. Oh, um, can you cite for grain run out versus riving and just saw to minimize run out? Um, you could. Um, I mean, that's a lot of what I was looking at before I rived it was how, you know, how does the grain actually look from the side? Um, but I think you're going to end up answering some of those questions by riving it. You know, if you're uncertain at all, 
um, you can certainly split it and it will answer those questions, but there's no reason why you can't just saw it. In other words, if you don't have a fro or you're trying to minimize, you know, the stock wastage, the best thing you can do is kind of look at the grain again, because you are not turning anything super, super narrow. So if we look at this, this is another piece, um, again, kiln dried, sawn stock. I'm looking at the radial plane here on this T. So you can see beautiful straight grain. That's what you're gonna see on um, the radial face. But you can see how the grain is running up and away a little bit here. There's a, just a gentle curve to the whole thing. If I were to split this edge, I need more stock in order to split that. This is too narrow to split at this point. If I ever split it right down the middle, you would find that this edge had kind of a bow to it because it's gonna follow those grain lines. See the same thing on the opposite face. There's these grain lines kind of run down at an angle. So splitting it wouldn't be perfectly parallel to this edge. But at the same time, I can look at these sawn edges and go, that's pretty dang close. Where it gets difficult is when you look at the tangential face, the flat sawn face here. And you can see how these growth lines kind of run and meander and waver about. And if I split this, there's every chance that it's gonna to try to follow this line and you could see it really runs out down here off the end and I could end up with a split that goes a little bit funky. If I flip it to the other side, I've got even less information here because I'm actually, this is actually good. I've got less information, but you can see I'm actually very close to a single growth ring. You can see this line right here is a transition between growth rings. There's another one right here, but they're very faint because there's very little of that growth ring left. I'm at the point where this growth ring almost covers the entire face and if I look at this, based on how this is tapering, this growth ring here lays on top of this one. So if I came in with a draw knife and I shaved this part away, you can see there's one, two, three growth rings here. This one lies on top. And you can see that because it kind of tapers out. Trees are nothing but cones. Think of those like conical drinking cups, those disposable drinking cups when you stack them on top of one another. They're just a series of cones. So this cone has tapered out it lays on top of this one, which lies on top of this one. So as I shave, I could shave this down until this growth ring disappears and it uncovers what's underneath it. Then I would shave this down till this growth ring disappears and I'd have nothing but a continuous growth ring on this face, which means I am with the grain the whole time. So I'm relatively close as I, so if I, I don't think I would really need to split this at all. It's pretty dang close to the grain. This face is a little bit different. I've got, down here, this growth ring is on top, then this one, then this one, then this one. So one, two, three, four, five different growth rings visible on this surface, but they're still, they're kind of wide. You see how there's that wide surface there as compared to something like this. There's a fair amount of cellulose between those growth rings. So we're relatively close. We're not at any kind of dramatic angle, which is verified by the fact that I look here and I can see these rings these lines are running relatively parallel to that edge. So to answer your question, I probably wouldn't split this. I'm not going to split this. Um, you know, I, I, I literally just took another piece like this, knocked the corners off on the, on the um, shave pony and I'm ready to turn it. If I were steam bending it, that might be a totally different equation um, because any of those run out areas you see are potential spots for splitting as you bend around a form. We're not steam bending here. I wouldn't try to steam bend kiln dried teak anyway. I don't think I'd want to steam bend air dried teak. I don't know, maybe I would. Um, wood that does not split well. The fact of the matter is, is that all wood all wood will split. Um, you get into the diffuse porous woods like the maples, um, it's more fracture than split, but there is still grain. There are still growth rings. What you find for the wood that does not split well, when you're in kiln dried, it's just really hard to get it to do it. And it ends up kind of fracturing like quartz or flint than wood. Uh, green maple will split relatively well. In fact, most Windsor chairs are made with maple legs that have been riven. Um, 
but you're not going to steam bin maple. Maple, it's, it's not impossible. You can certainly bin steam bin maple, but it, it's, it's a, the pores are really, really tiny and they're diffuse, so there's not a lot of compression, and the compression strength of maple is really, really high. The bending strength, I should say. So it's one of those things where I wouldn't use that wood for steam bending anyway, because we're not doing any steam bending in this, in this particular build. It doesn't really matter. That's why I'm kind of being cavalier about the stock here, because it doesn't matter. We're not making anything too thin that I need that ribbon strength and I'm not bending anything. If I were building a Windsor chair with a bent bow, say a sack back where I've got a full U-bend or a continuous arm with a full U-bend and then a, 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 a bend that's actually tangential to that, you need really good continuous grain. And that comes from shaving it down and going through that exercise I just showed you by planing away those, those growth rings. This is why I'll be doing a Windsor chair semester <laughs> in the hand tool school because there's a lot to talk about with all this. <laughs> I could show you that, um, the split on that crotch figure, but there's no way anyone could ever make sense of that wood because it's just nuts. Um, here's one thing, because, wow, it's been an hour already. That's what I was afraid of. Um, I wanted to show you, as I, as I chuck this up, you can't always be certain of the centers. So I'm going to set my tool rest. What I like to do is just kind of sight down over the bed and lock it in level with the edge, with the, the edge of the, the lathe bed itself. It just gives me something consistent to work against. So now I can use my tool rest as my reference point and I can check one inch away one inch, seven eighths, one inch. So I'm relatively centered right there. That's not bad. There's a little bit of a bulge just in the actual shape of the wood, but for the most part, it's centered. Let's look at this leg. Let's come to the fattest part here. That's pretty good. Again, there's a little bit of a, an out of roundedness just off the draw knife, but for the most part, just usually as I sight down the long axis and turn it, I can see that's pretty well centered. So I'm gonna leave it as is. I'm gonna tighten it up just a little bit and lock that in. Until I tighten it, I've got, you know, I can move it around, move the live center end a little bit and center it on the piece. So let's see. Where this is the ribbon piece, right? So this should be the most agreeable. Boy, you can really see that crazy color change in the teak when you look at you know this sawn surface and then how it's been riven, and you get these pinks and these pale, you know, greens and dark uh, mineral streaking and stuff. All that stuff's gonna just go away, probably go away um, by the end of this session. Tighten my tool rest down a little. I think. I'm trying to decide, I've got an, this leg is going to be an inch longer than I need. So I think what I'll do is I'll start down here and make this my tenon. Sorry guys, the chat room's on the other side of the shop now. David, I will be doing a Windsor chair in the Hantel School. I have wanted to do that for several years now. I'm going to do a green woodworking semester first in which we will discuss a lot of the properties of green wood and everything. We'll also build some of the stuff that we're going to need, like shaving horses and everything, um, and go over a lot of the tools and things that are necessary, and then probably end up building a post and rung chair. Sorry, I'm just dropping my, uh, my gouge. Once that semester is done, we have everything we need and I'm going to build Windsor chairs and I'd like to build uh, certainly two of them, maybe even three of them. We'll see. Okay. So.
So, oh man, I left my pattern over there. What did I say? We're making the front leg? Because my tool rest is actually shorter than the actual leg, um, I'm gonna get like the top section set and then I'm gonna move the tool rest down and I can finish the leg off, but I just really wanna work this little top section. It's actually a trick that I picked up from Peter Galbert. I'm al I was always moving my tool rest around and it's like, this is just dumb. Set it one spot, think it through. Okay, so the front, <laughs> there's the top. There's my tenon, there's my transition point. There's my first nodule. So I'm going to take, you know what? Let's use an easy wood tool just because why not? <laughs> I'm working in teak, let's use some carbide. So what I need to do is turn this line down to seven eighths and this line down to one and three sixteenths just so I can further my Galbert fanboy. This is the Galbert caliper. Love this thing. As you push this into the wood, this little depressor goes in and it gives you radii to work on. It's super, super fantastic. You could certainly set calipers for this, but this is like just awesome. I like it a lot. This is the thing I'm talking about with Peter. He's just kind of constantly innovating stuff, which is just so cool. So let's do the one and three sixteenths diameter first. this seven eighths oh where'd my gouge go there it is oh you know what Oh, that wasn't good. That wasn't the carbide. <laughs> I've got this little like half inch transition period. That is also needs to be a little bit less than one and three sixteenths just to give me that transition point. So now I'm gonna go ahead and turn the tenon just down to a cylinder. that's a 7 8 inch cylinder right now. I will taper that in a little bit.
get a narrower gouge here. Just clean this up. Uh, I'm not, frankly not good enough for the skew to use one that wide there. And then I'll use the long point of the skew. Just to create that little transition. Just creating little V notches here. There we go. So now I can move my whole tool rest down. And it just fits. Putting a face shield on <laughs> should have been done that a long time ago. That dry teak shaving spitting up in my face. And so now we've got this transition. There.
Ah, you idiot. <laughs> I just aligned the wrong part of the pattern. So first thing I need to do here, so I don't do this again, that's the top of the leg because I alternated them to try to keep it the same. Let me quote unquote erase my lines. Okay, let's try this again. So the front of the leg, I line the top of it. So next transition is right there. There's my last transition and then the leg ends right there. So this one, we've got to make one and three eighths of an inch. This one's one and 11 sixteenths. go. Check one and three eighths. One and three eighths. And then this goes down to thirteen sixteenths. There we go. So that's all my transition set. All right, let's just double check this. Top. One and three eighths, eleven sixteenths, thirteen sixteenths. So from here, I just get to shape a little. I want to create a little line right here. Careful.
There we go. <clears throat> okay. Anybody else's heart beating? Mine's beating. All right, let's move this in a little closer. And I need to raise my rest just a little. Just to make it a little bit easier to get. Yeah, over top of things. So there's my basic shape roughed out. I just need to come in and clean the whole thing up. this other skew right here. Nope, nope, nope. Let's go to, there's still too much wood here. Now I've got my tool rest too high, but such is life.
In order to finish up this leg, I, I kind of need to move my seat. This is the one drawback I will say of these Barnes pedal lathes. It's compared to the lathes where you're, you know, standing on the floor is you can obviously just shift your stance and move down. But since I'm sitting, it makes things a little bit more difficult. Well, I'm stopped. <laughs> Is anybody still here? Oh, my chat room disappeared. Jose, they are fun lays, but uh, they are difficult to come by. They can be hard to find. And nine times out of 10, when you find them, they've got a lot of parts missing. I've still got a little bit of tuning on this. First of all, I may take it off the mobile base altogether just because the rocking that you're seeing in here is actually the base itself shifting around and not the, um... oh, you idiot. You just moved your seat the wrong way. Yeah, when you set the lathe on the ground itself, it's quite strong. So I think the first thing I'm going to do is put some plywood in the mobile base to kind of shore up the, um, the rocking a little, see how that works. Because it is really nice to have it mobile like this. I can slide it around. But if that doesn't take it up, then I'm probably just going to have to do without the base. Um, and just kind of muscle it into place. I just don't like the idea of dragging these cast iron legs around because <clears throat> I don't want to break them. Okay, now that I've shifted my body down, I can get over here. Dang it, I was afraid of that. Like I said, this is, as much as I love this leg, or this lathe, when you're turning long stuff like this, it gets to be a little bit of an issue. Cause I think I moved it a little too far over and then I can't quite see my work. But if I move it too far, then your body gets in the way. Just like hand sawing, my body's in the way, I can't cut straight. There, that's a little better. need to make that nodule a little more pronounced. So I need to create a little bit more of a taper away from that. There we go. That's better. A little fat right there.
just moving any of these little fluctuations I see in the curve. I'm looking at this horizon. And I mean, I've said this publicly before, I'm not the world's best turner. So I rely pretty heavily on sandpaper to kind of get things just right. But I do try. I'm trying to get to the point where I can work right off the skew. That is made a little bit harder when you add lower RPMs into the mix. Ah, that's what was missing. There's a little too much swell there. Ah, that's much better. You just have to be careful. If you start to go uphill, it's going to start to get under the fibers and tear. That's why I have to shift and go back the other direction. There's just a lot of stuff playing with here. Keeping the edge engaged, but also changing that presentation as the diameter decreases. I have to lift the handle a little bit more. Still got just this weird spot right in the middle. There we go. That looks much better. You can feel the vibration too if you're starting to go up underneath the fibers. Router terms, if you're making a climb cut, you'll feel the vibration pick up. If you're working downhill and with the grain, you should get a nice smooth controlled cut. There we go. I think that looks pretty good. Yeah, I'm probably going to end up hitting that with sandpaper just because there's some tool marks and stuff there that would look a lot better if I had a sand them out but I think I can go straight to a high grit sandpaper so let's grab some two forty grit The sandpaper really brings out any of those areas that I had wasn't even. Highlights those little bumps.
And you know what? I need to... I need to bring this leg down just a little bit more. I'm, I'm actually not at my parting tool line. I guess I didn't see that at the time. I've got maybe another sixteenth of space to pick up there. So let's go ahead and reduce that. That may exactly be what I'm thinking looks wrong with the bottom part of this leg. It's just not skinny enough at the bottom. Uh, let's take that down. There we go. Yeah, I know. I just took grit all over this wood and now I'm bringing an edge tool back to it. But let's be honest, I'm turning teak anyway, so I'm probably going to have to hone these tools anyway. Yeah. Ah, oh, shoot. Well, we're going to take this a little bit thinner. Wasn't paying attention, folks. Hey, you're just glad that I didn't get profane there. There, we just accentuate that little bulge a little bit more. right there. There, see? You never know that I was an idiot and made a catch. Okay, there's our first leg. Not bad, not bad. Probably would have done things a little bit differently. If I'd moved my seat a little bit earlier so I could see over my gauge a little better. Um, in reference to Derek's question from earlier, why turn round and then mark? Um, because yeah, I am expecting that certain parts may not be round. Remember, I haven't turned this at all yet. All I've done is gone straight from, come on, change lenses, there we go. I've gone straight from this square blank, you know, and draw knifed. I mean, you could spend more time on the, on the um, draw knife, getting it perfectly square, perfectly round and everything. I'm sweating, folks. Look at that. <laughs> That's terrible. I normally, when I turn, I open the garage door. Because I'm right up against the garage door, because the camera's mounted there, I've got absolutely no circulation of air whatsoever. It's just like building a little heat cloud. It's a good 10 degrees warmer on that side of the shop. If I open the door, it make a big difference. <clears throat> um, but, it, it, Certainly, you're going to get a cleaner layout line if it's already round. If it's not round, your pencil is going to bounce and jump all over the place. Um, if you take the time to get it into a round cylinder, then you mark it. You're going to get more consistent layout lines. And I am absolutely expecting that some parts of the leg may not be perfectly round. So what we're left with is 
I, I can saw this little block off at the end and I need to create the half inch taper. So to do that, a lot of folks will turn it right on the lathe and I've certainly done that before. There's a good kind of um, gauge you can use if you, um, if you bore a hole in, your, in a block with, in this case, we're using half inch auger bits to bore through the seat. If you bore a hole and then you ream that hole, then you can actually cut that block, that test block in half, and you've got a little gauge guide that you can put on your, your lathe. But these Veritas tenon cutters, taper tenon cutters, are, are really fantastic. They make things super easy because now I can come back and set the taper cutter and dial in that perfect tapered tenon. I just sharpened this blade, so I've got to reset it. So let's purposely set it wide and just see. Yeah. Nope, a little bit more. I hate having to sharpen these blades because that's why this, that's why good turners <laughs> will um, just turn this taper on the lathe itself because these things just take a lot of fiddling to get just right. Got to move this side down just a bit. Obviously, it's a lot easier if I can micro adjust a little bit more. So now it's cutting like I want it. Let me go ahead and clamp the leg upright. Just gonna sight down it and see that I'm relatively square here. And let me adjust the camera so you guys can see what I'm doing. So it's clamped in my leg vise, held upright. could be even more aggressive. Like I said, these are useful. Once you get them set, man, try to keep them set as long as possible because they just, if anybody knows a more efficient way to set these up, I'd love to hear it. I mean, you could set it heavier, but it just ends up, it can end up causing a mess if you set it too heavy. There we go. Now, top part still needs to come in a little bit. It's not cutting as heavily up top. I 
And what I'm looking for is pretty much a full length shaving, at least where it's engaged in the, uh, in the wood. And yeah, that's what I thought. I never can remember the half inch size that this says this is. I'm pretty sure that was the smallest diameter. It is, just had to make sure. What I probably should have done is at least add a little bit of taper so I'm not forcing my tinning cutter to do quite so much. There we go. One tapered tenon. And at the top, I've got a half inch diameter that will match the holes that we bore in the seat. So, um, as anyone who's watched my live session should have predicted, we went way over time um, and I didn't get to the octagonally shaped leg, but um, I don't know. Was that really that important? <laughs> Does anybody really need to see the octagonal shaped leg? If you do, you know, let me know. Um, I certainly have, have shown that before, but uh, it was more of just as a, as a homage to people who don't have lathes, but I like my lathe. So this is one front leg. I have to go back and do two more back legs. Um, so between now and my next broadcast, I will turn my two back legs. I'm gonna go ahead and take this piece and this piece and turn them down round because those are gonna be my stretchers. I don't know my final length of my stretchers yet, but while I'm turning, I'm gonna go ahead and, and get them um, relatively ready to go. Next broadcast, what I'll do is show you how I went about creating the seat pattern, uh, refine the seat pattern a little bit more, lay it out on the seat blank. We're gonna to have to flatten the seat blank lay out the pattern, locate all the holes. We're going to bore and ream the holes to get everything exactly right. So by the time that's all done, I'll essentially have a flat plank seat set up with my legs, everything right. And then I can really test, do I have my leg lengths right? Do I have everything right? Then we'll go about carving the seat. It may be really ambitious to try to get all that done. So as I said, I'm not exactly sure how many broadcasts I'm going to do. I can tell you, however, that um, the next broadcast will be next Saturday. I'm unable to broadcast tomorrow. I wanted to do it over the whole weekend, but I just, uh, life is in the way here. So um, if you want to build this, you've got enough today to at least get the legs started and laid out. I will link to the patterns that I was working from from, from Peter Galbert's uh, blog. And, um, you know, if you're building along, go ahead and turn your three legs because when you next see me, I will have three legs. Um, any other questions? Uh, Derek says he would like to see the octagonal leg. Man, hard to type, dude. Um, but um, you know what? I, I'm, it wouldn't take too much longer. I just, I don't have any more time today. It's, it's already two o'clock. But um, yeah, the, the key, Derek, with the octagonal leg is you want to start with square stock. You want your stock to be S4S and square all the way around. It's one of the reasons that I um, left, well, I've left two of them, but I left one of them, I'm not going to cut, clip the edges off on the, um, the lathe. So um, there is a live session I did a while ago about creating a tapered leg. And that's where you're going to start. You're going to start by creating a four-way taper. And then you're going to knock those corners off to create the octagon. So um, yeah, I'll absolutely show that So in a future episode. So anyway, um, I appreciate everybody coming out. I appreciate everybody hanging out and watching me turn on the lathe. It's probably not the most exciting stuff in the world, but you know, hey, we, uh, we got one leg done, two more to go.